Support for the podcast comes from The Reach Group, a team of non-attorney educational advocates committed to educating parents on regular education, special education, and mental health support available to their child. Their goal is to arm families with the information they need to advocate for their children by offering IEP coaching, parenting guidance, assistance with identifying community support organizations, school choice, and transition planning. Through their sliding scale and scholarship program, they aim to ensure no family is left behind in their quest for quality education. Learn more about The Reach Group at thereachgroup.net. Parents and professionals, and welcome back to Parenting Stuff I Wish I Knew Sooner. I want you to know now I'm your host, Erica Dester, founder of the Center for Confident Parenting and a mom who seems to learn everything I need to know the hardest way. I am excited to be joined today by my first teen guest, <laughs> Sophie, Me. Who is 16 years old, going into the 11th grade. Sophie, I've only had adults on so far, and I'm really excited to have not just a teen, but you're going to tell us all about um, your autism, what it means to you, how we can, how we as parents can speak and act in ways that help us connect. So thank you for being here. You're welcome. All right. So the goal of this podcast, in my mind, is to help parents learn the things they need to know hopefully before they even need to know them or as soon as they need to know them. So tell us a little bit about your diagnosis of autism. Parents might be getting, you know, a diagnosis for their kids now or soon. Um, How does autism affect you on a day-to-day basis? What does it look like and how does it factor into your day? Well, on a day-to-day basis, it depends on, for example, is it a day-to-day basis on a vacation? Is it a Mm. day-to-day basis at school? Is it a day-to-day basis just lounging around in in my room during the summer? Yeah. In general, it does differ. However, so you there mean are it's things... highly different based on whatever the environment yeah. is well, or the scenario. Not highly different, but different challenges can pop up. Mm-hmm. For example, if I'm traveling, if I'm on vacation, I might not have the same access to to my small selection of foods that I eat. Mm-hmm. For example, when I was younger, it used to be a lot bigger of a problem that whenever we were on vacation and went to eat breakfast. They didn't have one of the couple breakfast foods foods I liked, which are very specific, and I ended up having a lot of meltdowns. There, mm-hmm. We no longer have that problem, however, it was a bigger issue when I was younger. Right, for sure. Sensory issues in general can be a big issue, causing issues of trouble of not being able to do as many things. Mm-hmm. For example, um... I have this gravitational insecurity in which if I do something that involves a lot of need for balance and stuff, I get really anxious. I can't mm. swim. I, I can't really ride a bike. That's too scary. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, so as you know, we have a teen son in our house also with a diagnosis of autism. And we had a, a family vacation not long ago where he actually had to go home early because it was so challenging. Um, And I remember him saying to me in the moment, when I'm here, I don't have all the things I need for me to be me. (laughs) Is that how it feels when you're in a different environment? Yeah. Yes. Um, Other things include, I struggle with social stuff. Mm -hmm. And it has not fully caused as many issues, but can make me seem awkward. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, to other people's I, perceptions. <laughs> you don't think you're awkward, I do. You? do um, I some, struggle somewhat with nonverbal communication, but, like, I can tell sometimes what people look like or maybe what their, like, emotion is. However, I struggle to tell when I'm boring people. And mm. even occasionally, sometimes somebody will be mad at me and I'll struggle to know exactly the best way to respond. Such as at one point a classmate was mad at me, so they were like staring angrily at me, and I uh, and I first thought that they were trying to do a staring contest. <laughs> I see, I see. Well, that brings up my next question: What are some things that people do, or the parents do, or peers, or say that you do not like, enjoy, that aren't helpful, that you wish they would do differently? Um, purposefully triggering my sensory issues. Mm. That that that's a big one. 
Um, I mean, it doesn't happen too often, luckily, and it never really has happened with adults. Okay, that's more a peer thing. I, however, a lot of times with other kids won't fully understand how hard it can actually be with some of my, with some of these sensory issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some other things I can think of of things which I don't like when adults do is I don't, it, and kids do, and just people around me do is I don't like it when people don't treat my meltdowns well, such as, for example, treating a meltdown like a disciplinary problem or telling me to calm down. That never works. Mm. Telling me it's a little problem. That doesn't work. Right. And your point would be it is more of a mental health issue. It's not a disciplinary problem. It's not just Mm -hmm. you displaying a certain behavior. Yep. Super, super important. Um, okay, and what are some things that people, peers, parents do and say that you think are awesome and they helpful and you wish we did more of? I would say validating my, validating my emotions. Now, it just doesn't mean that you have to say that somebody would have to say, wow, your response of screaming and, and crying and everything is like totally appropriate or I feel like that, that mm-hmm. how However, there's a difference between that and trips saying that, well, it's not a big deal, oh, it's not that, it's not that, because it still feels like a big deal to me. Absolutely. And just just validating by saying, I get that you're upset. Mm-hmm. Just that can do a lot. Just saying something such as, are you all right? Like, yeah. I, I know this sounds selfish, but I kind of wish I got more pity. The first time people mm-hmm. see you, first or second time people see you cry, that that they, they they're they're like that and try to help a bit, but like the next times it's just you know that's just what Sophie does. Mm. And I wish that people would realize that I'm still just as upset every, every time I cry. Right, right. Exactly. I also wish people would in general do more of like being kind and including me. Mm-hmm. I and also starting conversations with me. Now would stop that. I don't start conversations a lot. I do. Um. One of the things on, like, my um, personalized education plan include is a strength, initiating conversations. Mm. Though I'm not always the best at actually knowing the best way to initiate, but I'm getting off track. Topic. Right. No, it's good. Hey, hey, however, you're doing great when, in this conversation however, right now. However, in general, most times people don't really start many conversations with me. Also, another thing which I wish is that I wish that people would be blunter with me. Luckily enough, I go to a special education school where practically everyone else also has autism. Well, not everyone else, but the majority. Yeah. Meaning that kids end up being fairly blunt with me most of the time right. anyway. Right. But it still just matters yeah. a lot to me. And maybe we can do an example. I know we didn't practice this, so I hope you're okay with that. But mm-hmm. let's go back to the example you gave of someone was really mad at you. And what they chose to do in that moment was to, to glare at you, which you interpreted at first as a staring contest. Yes. What is, what would you want that person to do or say? I would that want the, the person blunt? to say, um, I'm angry at you because of this, which by the way, I did ask him, wait, are you angry at me? And then he said, yes, because of, be, be, still though, what I get, for example, that that even I sometimes struggle with being the most straightforward. So this is like sure. perfect scenario type thing. Sure. A lot of times people aren't always the best at saying, I'm angry at this, or I'm angry at that, because sometimes it also just kind of sounds awkward. Yes. Well, and I think I can only speak for myself as a neurotypical person. I probably uh-huh. think that I'm trying to be kind by not being blunt. But what I hear you saying is, that is what you need. And blunt is not mean. Blunt is clear, right? Mm-hmm. I am mad at you because of X, Y, and Z instead of acting like it's okay or just staring you down, which doesn't necessarily mean anything to you. Yep. Yep. In general, okay. there there are ways to be blunt that is insulting and rude. I found what I try to do, though sometimes I fail, um, is try to focus on tact. The idea of being able to, like, maybe it's not, it's a in between between bluntness and just white lies, in which you're still being blunt, but you're being blunt in a nicer way. That cushions yes. that cushions the fall. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a perfect way to say like it. For, and I know- for, for a quick example, for example, the difference between saying if somebody asks you to do something you don't want to do, lying would just be yes. Saying right. no would be 
say no, screw you, be too blood would be blunt and rude. Saying no would just be blunt. Also, right. a lot, and saying no, thank you would be tactful. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I know you said when we were practicing um, or prepping, you wish people uh-huh. would gain more awareness, more education about the symptoms yes. and what this does look like on a day to day basis. So, first especially, of all, thank you for uh-huh. helping us with that. <laughs> yeah. Especially other autistics. This is like yes. a minor complaint. It doesn't really affect me at all. It just kind of annoys me when I talk to a lot of other autistics who don't really understand as much the actual symptoms. For example, a kid at my school, another autistic kid at my school, oh, says, why do you always take everything so literally? Mm. To which I say, <laughs> because I have autism. Like, I, I went to school because I have autism. Right. And they're like, yeah, but like, that's not a symptom of autism. It is. It's, it's not Maybe even like- Maybe not for him. Yeah, yeah, maybe and the guy says, "Well, it's not a symptom for me, or it's not a symptom for my friend, or whatever." It's like, but it still is a symptom. Not everybody has the same symptoms. It's a very heterogeneous condition. Absolutely, and I, I think the only way we can get a good understanding of that is is to just keep talking to autistic individuals and hearing how this manifests for them and what how they want us to act. Mm-hmm. See. Um, so thank you for being the first one on the show to do that. Another thing I wanted to ask you. How there's a lot of debate about the language we use and how we view disabilities. So some people would say autism is a disability. Some people say it's a superpower. You can only speak for yourself, I realize. But how do you view your autism? As a disability, I don't see it as a superpower. Well, it's true that some autistics have savant abilities. For example, my older brother, also diagnosed with autism, has some savant abilities. So they've weighed as that they've weighed through some time, mm-hmm. and as he's got a better handle of his other autism symptoms. Savant abilities are somewhat of a superpower, however, also in general, they don't end up being that helpful in day-to-day life, a lot mm-hmm. of them, as more as just being something that would be cool as a party trick. Yeah. Like, for example, my brother, you give him a date, date, wait 10 seconds, and my brother will be able to tell you what day of the week that date was. Wow. I don't really know what situations that'll be like really there's helpful not, for, but it's right. Cool. There's not a lot of practical application. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when it comes to myself though, I personally do not have savant syndrome. I am considered gifted, twice exceptional, however, I don't have savant syndrome. Okay. Um and my autism I do believe plays a factor in how um I'm good at math. Because I believe some of the pattern mm-hmm. nature of autism. However, autism, for the most part, is a disability. Um, I am disabled when I can't really do as much stuff. Like, you know what? I, I don't like live music. I'd hate live music. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember, like, I like sitting... I remember I was at this camp thing over the summer. And at this camp, dirt camp include a lot of little kids. And these little kids, they start talking and screaming a bunch. And I ended up having to go to, like, this area near the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Because it was the quietest place I could go. And right. just, like... And, like, at one point I almost cried even. And at another point I did something which I later regretted and apologized for. In which I ended up cursing at some of the kids. They were, like, mm-hmm. little kids. Sure. I apologized for that. I made meds. I tried. But still, though, like... Yeah. yeah. And that's why you're comfortable framing it as a disability, viewing it yeah. that way. Because Other... in that situation, yeah. everyone else was nope. able to navigate that more smoothly yeah. and you you weren't mm-hmm. so that's what makes it a disability a lot of the times people talk about rigidity and stubbornness and autism and talk about specifically about the idea of resistance to change which is also a big part of it there are some which i don't see talked about as much is the idea of not necessarily resisting to like changing its schedules and stuff but resistance to change the idea of what you thought would happen the right. idea, and a lot of people probably don't talk about as much because it may sound offensive to say, "Oh, well, a lot of autistics struggle to deal with when they don't get their way." They, that that. But you had a vision of how that was going to go. Yeah. And the reality wasn't able yeah. to match your vision. One, and one time, you like I you decided I would confront this guy in eighth grade because he because I was annoyed at how he told me that I kept ruining his jokes. So it turned out mm. I didn't realize they didn't want me to add on to his jokes. It took me a couple months to realize that. Right. There are autism, social disability type stuff. Right, um, right. And I remember I was getting all ready to confront him. I created this entire speech inside my head. And I walk up to him and he says, I don't care. And leaves. Oh. 
And then I cried because everything did go as I expected. Exactly. What is it? That's actually really helpful to hear with respect to my son, too. Um, one more question I didn't prepare you for. When you are, to use your own word, having a meltdown, what is mm -hmm. the absolute worst thing a parent could do or say? Well, I have not experienced the absolute worst thing a parent could do or okay. say, definitely. <laughs> However, the worst thing you could Good do job is, for your parents. Is, 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 pro, is pro restraint. Pro restraint, okay. I've heard some bad things about it. Pro mm -hmm. restraint is a restraint in which a parent, like, person gets on top of autistic it's like can possibly cause injury possibly be even deadly yeah. i have not experienced it mm -hmm. i've never really okay. experienced restraint there was this something else which i experienced a bit of which i forget what it was called but basically i was held while moving me from place to place a bit when i was mm -hmm. having a meltdown back in first grade a couple times and i really did not like that does not work for you. Um, what does work for you in a meltdown? what does work for me i'd say is that quieter spaces uh, trying to remove more pressure try not to add on as much pressure onto me just don't put push don't push much pressure pressure onto me in terms of stuff um in general a calmer adult soft voice uh, emotional validation and i and in general, just, um, and I will say this is difficult because truth be told, I feel like a lot of the power struggles happen because I personally saw them as power struggles, but try to avoid a power struggle. Mm -hmm. I would say that something is important for the parent to do is what is when a child is having a meltdown and you find yourself getting really, really stressed out. If, if possible, if there is another parent or adult there that is able, that is able and free to help out the child. I suggest taking a break and letting them handle it for some time because mm. of the fact that when a child is having a meltdown, it's very important for the adult to also be able to be calm. And the issue, though, is that meltdowns can meltdowns are kind of the opposite of calm. They tend to elicit a lot yeah. more stronger, more anxiety-inducing feelings. So in general, what's important is be able to take breaks for yourself. And when you, are, when you have, receive a calm adult in the moment of a meltdown, are you able to eventually borrow from there what like, from there what does that mean for you quarrel from there borrow like are borrow you able from... to see how calm they are and eventually get yourself back to that well it's less thing? seeing how calm they are and it's more just the fact that nothing is escalated the thing about Good meltdowns point. is that meltdowns in general they tend to they eventually end up de-escalating on their own Right. Oh, no, not always. So less many is more. times, just the general meltdowns can, in fact, de-escalate. Just the issue, of course, is to make sure to give the child the best environment for the meltdown to simmer right. down. So As if our voice to... is raising, that's, uh -huh. that's preventing the de-escalation because we're yeah. now adding Also, on. something else, which I will say, is that this is by way, like, I do not think that it's necessarily, like, something that's, like, terrible or whatever. However, for some reason, I think it's because younger me grew up with this. Just in general, this typical special education teacher voice. I think you have it somewhat too. Just this <laughs> sure voice, middle-aged woman voice, for some <laughs> reason, can be very agitating. I don't really know why. I, I think it's because it kind I, of reminds I can me handle that. I'm okay with I that. Dealt with stuff. <sighs> yeah. What about lots of words? I know I will often come at my son with a long explanation of why he doesn't need to be so upset or, or look at the bright side. Are you hearing words um, in the space of I don't feel down. like that has had as much of an effect on me at the same time though I do get how that could be definitely an issue for a lot of other autistics especially mm -hmm. especially autistics who have their own processing issues right right okay so you can only speak for yourself but it sounds like less is more remain calm yeah. validate emotions first use a softer voice take breaks for yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> are you a fan of someone telling you to calm down no, I am not. As I said before, I don't like calm down. I, I don't like chill out. I don't feel like it's a small problem. Helps up. It's not helpful useful. either. Um, I'd also right. say, oh, yeah, unless, I also say, um, keep your hands to yourself unless mm -hmm. the child is in danger. If the child is in danger, the first priority should, of course, be make sure that they are not going to be in danger. Make sure they're not going to be in danger. Mm -hmm. That's the first priority. If the child is in danger. However, otherwise, keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. 
because luckily that enough, this has been my situation well. for a lot of times, luckily. However, I will say in general. If the child is in danger, so. Yes. Okay. Because some people might prefer touch to help calm and others it uh-huh. will add to what they're processing, right? Also, there's something else from an earlier question, which I forgot to mention, but I'm going to say here, which is that when it comes to adults, something which I really want done is I want more of when you give, this is when you give out directions, please give them out as blunt and making sense. Like, for example, I know that some students may also feel pressured by it at the same time, though. However, in general saying, you can do this. Can you, can you please put up the chairs? And I hear that. And especially when I was younger, I just think, okay, then, no, I won't. You said, can you? I decide, I won't then. And then you get surprised when the teacher would get upset with me. And then you get upset back because, of course, my idea, well, they said that I don't need to. Don't get why now. And then it ended up in an argument and stuff. So just in general, yeah. write down and be direct with the directions. Very clear. Okay. You are doing awesome. I want to get you out of here. I have one more question. If you can talk directly to a parent who's listening now and maybe having a hard time connecting with their teenager because they are differently wired or because they've hit the teenage years, what do you want that parent to know that they can do? I will say that personally for me, I've had a much easier time connecting with my parents. However, I know this may not be the case for everyone. Um, I will say that something, if you haven't done this already, possibly, and this won't work with every child, since not every child's special interests, and some kids may be awkward talking about their special interests. Sometimes I get that way with a couple. couple. Um, However, if possible, I suggest connecting with a child for their special interests. I remember at school there was this project, this inquiry project. My teacher gave this research project in ninth grade, and and she had this... she had this thing in which basically you could choose practically any topic we wanted to research about. A lot of kids, of course, ended up choosing their special interests. And basically the idea was that the, the teacher was autistic herself, so were almost all the students, was that the teacher realized that a lot of students would choose their special interests, and the goal was to be able to teach students how to research based on giving them something that will help them research what they like. Mm, mm-hmm. Yep, exactly, exactly. I know that the special interests are very, very, mm-hmm. very important. Um, awesome. Thank you so yep. much, Sophie, for sharing your experience, your honesty, your voice, Goodbye. parents. I will be back soon with more things that I wish I knew sooner. And let's always remember, if you know one person that has autism, you truly only know one person that has autism. So let's That, that is very true. Um, right? <laughs> uh, can, I, can I speak on that a bit? Yes, please. When, when it comes to when you only know one person who is autism, you know one person who is autism, I see some stuff talking about autism diversity. A lot of times I see people talking about it, say, well, because some autism is more severe than others. So while that may mm. be true, they don't really understand just how freaking diverse it actually is. Yeah. Like, autism in general just is such a heterogeneous condition. Even little symptoms can show differently. For example, I knew a kid did also had a lot of sensory problems with noise. However, even with me and him and, like, oversensitivity to noise, he was more sensitive to a lot of noises together. Like, he was not a big fan of, for, like, he got a lot more overstimulated when a lot of people were talking and stuff and yep. some other types of noises. Well, I tend to get a lot more overstimulated by loud noises, loud sudden noises. I mean, this guy, he wasn't overstimulated by the noises of fire alarms like I tend to be. So I just right. found that kind of I mean, it sounds like even amongst autistic people, uh-huh. there's still some awareness that needs to happen of like, oh, your version, this is how it affects you, and this is how it affects yep. me, and we're different. Um, so Definitely. really all we can do as people and parents is keep listening. Keep listening to everyone that's willing to talk. Keep an open mind. Don't make assumptions. Um, and I feel very honored that you helped us with that today, Sophie. Thank you so, so much. Mm-hmm. All right, parents and professionals, I'll be back soon um, with more stuff that I and others wish we knew sooner. Thank you.